nice to greet you again as we gather for this online worship service for Brisbane City Temple. Over the last number of weeks, we've been exploring what it means to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus. And if you caught up with us last week, whether you were here in person in our building or whether you were watching online, you would have heard me use that phrase a number of times during the sermon, as you go. That idea of the fact that Jesus sent his disciples out. And he says, as you go into the world, make disciples. And you can see over my shoulder there on the, uh, the back wall, a display with some shoes on it. And those shoes really indicate that idea that as we go into the world, doing our regular every day of life, that we are to be disciples and we are to make disciples for Jesus. At the core of that, at the heart of what that means, is what do we believe? Do we really believe that Jesus is who he said he was? We're going to begin our time of worship today by singing a song that really states this idea of what we believe. And it says, I believe that God the Father can be seen in Christ the Son. I believe in transformation. And even though this world is changing and is surrounded by shifting values, the promises of Jesus are unchanging. So let's begin today by worshipping and singing this idea of what we believe. And I pray that as we sing these words, they ring true for you in what you believe as a disciple or a follower of Jesus.
Well, the scriptures are God's revelation to us, revealing himself through his word. And while we read God's word to understand who he is and learn how to live life as followers of his, we can also use scripture as a way to pray. And this morning, as part of our prayer time, we're going to use some of Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 14. And this is Paul's prayer for the church. So this morning, as this prayer appears on the screen, may you pray this for yourself. May you pray it for those who you know. May you pray it for the church, not just the Salvation Army at Brisbane City Temple, but the church worldwide, that it will be the representation of God here on earth. Waiting. We wait all the time. We wait to fall asleep at night. We wait on responses to emails. We wait for babies to be born, for our pay to hit our bank account, for trains and buses to come, for our hair to grow, for the fish to bite, waiting for yes or no, waiting for our phone to charge. All of us are waiting for something. And if we were honest, most of us don't like to wait. We often get frustrated waiting on fast food or waiting behind the slow car in the fast lane. We're always in a rush to get to the next place or the next thing. Waiting. We see it negatively today. Waiting for something is a bad thing. That's why we invented credit cards to take the waiting out of wanting. Ask a child whether he or she likes waiting and you can guarantee that the answer is no. And we see that same attitude in society today. When asked to wait or told we have to wait, our answer is no. I do recognize that there are some people from an older generation who know the benefits of waiting. You saved up so you could buy things. 
you waited for marriage and you stood firm in the face of pressure and you know that waiting can be a good thing. Today we find the disciples of Jesus waiting. Let's read from Acts chapter 1 verses 1 to 8. Acts 1 to 8. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them convincing proof that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about his spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptizes with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel. He said to them, It is not for you to know the time or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Last week we heard Jesus tell his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. He gave them his authority and he said, as you go about life, make disciples. But today we hear Jesus tell them to wait. It seems a bit of a contradiction. You say go and now you say wait. Can you just make up your mind, Jesus, so that we know what we're supposed to do? The passage that we read last week was from the book of Matthew. And Matthew is believed to be one of Jesus' first disciples. He was an eyewitness to all that Jesus did and said. This week, in the book of Acts, it's written by Luke. And Luke wasn't an original disciple. He didn't know the physical Jesus. He didn't spend three years being discipled by Jesus. But instead, he spoke to those people who did, those eyewitnesses. He spoke to Jesus' family, to Jesus' friends, and of course, to the disciples. And they all gave Luke an eyewitness account of Jesus' teaching and his life. Luke writes the book of Acts and the book of Luke. And he's actually writing it to somebody called Theophilus. And in his writings, he is witnessing to Theophilus about Jesus. He's telling the story of Jesus' life and teaching. And we actually get a bit of a glimpse into this disciple-making process way back in the first century. People giving witness to Jesus who tell someone else. As I said last week, we heard Jesus say after he told the disciples to go, He said to them, I would be with you always. We see that in Matthew 28, verse 20. Now, I wonder if the disciples actually thought about that afterwards, because what happened after Jesus said those words, as we've just read in Acts, is that Jesus was taken back up into heaven. He was no longer with them. So I wonder if the disciples thought, well, how can Jesus be with us? How can that promise be fulfilled. Well, Jesus knew exactly how that promise would be fulfilled. He would be with them by his spirit and they were going to have to wait to receive that. The Holy Spirit would be Jesus' continuing presence with his disciples. They would discover that the same Jesus who had lived and died and been raised up would be the source of their power to live the abundant life that Jesus had promised them. When he said that they would never be alone and that he would be with them always, Jesus was saying it would be by his spirit. The power that the disciples would receive wouldn't be something but someone. Jesus himself 
living in them. When we first moved to Brisbane, I was surprised to see how many hospitals there are in this city. One of those hospitals was called Holy Spirit Northside. It's since changed its name to St. Vincent's. But I was really intrigued by this thought of a Holy Spirit hospital. And I wondered what kind of treatment were people receiving inside that hospital? Now, I recognize that it wasn't about receiving the Holy Spirit. That was just the name of the hospital. But one day as we were driving along, just happened to glance to see a sign on the side of the road that was giving directions to the Holy Spirit Northside Hospital. And what the sign actually said, it had it slightly abbreviated. It said, Holy Spirit N-side. The North had actually been taken away and just replaced with the N. And I was really thinking about that and just recognizing that that's exactly what happens. The Holy Spirit is inside of us. Over the coming weeks, we'll explore the Holy Spirit more. We want to learn what uh, we can expect when the Holy Spirit lives inside us and what we can do to open our lives for the Holy Spirit to flow through us. We see today that the disciples were not to set out in their own power to go and make disciples of all nations, but to do it in the power of Jesus. And they needed to wait for that power to come on them and to be in them. You know, the waiting is significant and we need to pay attention to the waiting times in our life too and the purpose for waiting. Just like Jesus didn't want the disciples rushing out doing ministry in their own power, he doesn't want us to rush out in our own power to do things for him either. Just like Jesus directed his first disciples to wait on the Spirit, he's telling us today to wait, to wait on his Spirit, to seek his direction and to only move forward in the power of his Spirit. Many of us, myself included, rush ahead in our own power, using our own abilities or resources as we do God's work. And we don't give the Holy Spirit much or any opportunity to guide, to lead or to do his work through us. We're pretty self-sufficient. And yet when we push ahead in our own strength, we may find that we are actually off course or we're focused on our own agenda, which is not God's agenda for us. There was an interesting dialogue between the disciples and Jesus in our reading today, which actually highlights what can happen when we operate in our own power and strength and how we can actually get the priorities wrong. When they'd come together, the disciples said to Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you'll restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus had told the disciples that they were to go and make disciples of all the nations. But the question asked here was about whether Jesus was going to sort out the land and the political issues the people of Israel had experienced for many years. The disciples were actually looking back, hoping for the re-establishment of a previous glory and power well, Jesus was actually looking forward to an even more glorious future and he was wanting to show them their part in that future. But it seemed at this point in time in their own power, the disciples were looking at what was in it for them. Without the Holy Spirit guiding them and leading them, the disciples were going to head off on a different agenda. It was different to what Jesus had in mind. They needed to wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon them so that they could be effective witnesses for Jesus, so that they could concentrate on what mattered for the kingdom of God. I believe Jesus is asking us today some very direct questions. Sharon, are you concentrating on what matters for God's kingdom? Sharon, are you living life in the power of my spirit? Are you depending on my spirit? Are you prepared to sit and wait for my spirit to lead you and to not rush ahead with your own plans? I've been thinking a bit about the Lord's Prayer lately. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, there's a phrase in there that says, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
God's will done on earth happens when God's people surrender and depend on the Holy Spirit. If we long for God's kingdom to advance, if we have compassion on the lost and hurting people of the world, we will increasingly want and seek the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we will wait and we will use the waiting time to continue praying and asking God to do his work in us. Waiting can be a good thing. We make a commitment today to wait in prayer for the power of God, the Holy Spirit to lead you. Lives that are lived in their own strength and separated from the Holy Spirit are powerless. They also become dull and dreary. Without the Holy Spirit, our ministry remains the work of the flesh. Our attempt to serve others becomes difficult and tiring. We turn up, but our hearts aren't there. We would rather not turn up, but we do because of a sense of obligation. When we sacrifice, we feel dead rather than alive. A living sacrifice is what we desire to be. We pray, but little happens. We get frustrated because we want to see more. Jesus is fully God, yet fully man. And he shows us the importance of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus only started his ministry after the Holy Spirit came on him. And we too need the Holy Spirit to impact our world and to serve others. The Holy Spirit doesn't come just so that we can have a feel-good experience. The Holy Spirit has something more profound and permanent for us. And through the Holy Spirit, God gives us the opportunity to represent him, to extend his kingdom here on earth. Interestingly, when any machine is operated according to the purpose it was made for, it always runs much better. So when we operate under the power of the Holy Spirit, we can't help but do what we were created to do, which is to know God and make him known, to worship him and witness about him. I'm praying for you that the Holy Spirit will draw you into a deeper relationship with him and a greater sense of dependence upon him. I'm praying that as you surrender to the Holy Spirit and seek him, that you would have an increasing sense of your purpose as one of God's representative, one of God's witnesses here on earth. And as you reach out to others, your sense of purpose and fulfillment in life would greatly increase. Wait. Wait for God's power. Depend on the Holy Spirit so that you can be an effective witness for Jesus in this world.